This Wednesday will be a men's Bible study. We had it last Wednesday for a repeat, and uh, because um, Matt couldn't make it, and uh, Jared, you didn't have to come anyway, but he could have if he wanted to. After you guys left, uh, Dylan asked if we could have the study, so I said I can have it, and then some of the other guys came, so we just kind of reviewed. So next, this Wednesday we'll have our regular men's Bible study at seven o'clock, and um, the. Uh, the 23rd, which is this Saturday. This Saturday, we have the Sabres thing. So if you want to come and help, come about 10 30. 9 30. 9 30. <laughs> we have to be there at 11. <laughs> so, and uh, I'll hook, hit a book with our um, wagon, and then we have bags we have to take over. You know where Sabres is, anybody? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's something that we do for our church. And it's a good way to get rid of your old clothes and stuff. Memory verses first. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. By the time we're done with Psalms, we'll have Psalm 1 memorized. And then if you can actually stand up and quote it, uh, there'll be a prize. I don't know what that prize is in. I guess it depends on how many people actually quote it. <laughs> but that's the intent. Every time we read this, try to hide that in your heart. But we're in Psalm 36. It's going to be... Who knows when I'll ever finish Psalms, and uh, it might be another guy, who knows. But uh, once we get done with Psalms, you know, because I might die tomorrow, you know, I'm not eternal, right? <laughs> Mary knows that, right? She looked at me like, yeah, get rid of that guy. 
take time. Alright, let's take our hymn books, turn to hymn 82, or just look up on the screen. It's hard to get out of the habit of saying that. Praise the Lord, the Lord. Psalm 36, the song of David, the servant, servant of the Lord. <clears throat> the transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. He devises mystic upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reaches unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are great deep, are a great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of mercy. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. <clears throat> For with thee is the fountain of thy life, of life, in thy light shall we see light. O continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee, and thy righteousness to the upright in heart. 
Let not the foot of pride come against me, and let not the hand of the wicked remove me. There are the workers of iniquity fallen. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. I think God blesses me with his best description. I struggle reading it because I'm used to reading it in Hebrew with English. So I'm looking at two different words. So I apologize for that. But um, <clears throat> let's look at the uh, prayer uh, list that I have somewhere in the choir list. And uh, I'll continue to pray for Elaine. Elaine is on a course of antibiotics until probably close to the end of the month, right? And pray for Keith as well. Um, continue to pray for Gerard and his friend. And uh, back, knee, anything else? <laughs> okay, good, good. Well, I thought maybe you picked up on a little bit of a sign. And we oh, back. we have uh, visitors back here. My old bowling partner, finally <laughs> showed up. Must have got a new ball. <laughs> okay. Well, glad to see you guys here. Uh, continue to pray for uh, uh, Matt Dorak. And uh, he has uh, vascular blockages. And I'm uh, um, going to have some stints put in. And then he's dancing like a validator, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a pretty picture, right? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I'd like to see that. Yeah, I would too. <laughs> yeah. I continue to pray for our country and yeah. all the things that are going on. And uh, pray for safety for those in Washington this week <coughs> and uh, around the country, I guess. And um, continue to pray for. Uh, put uh, Dylan on your uh, prayer. Last week, a member of our church now, and he's a, a freshman at Texas A&M, and uh, I had a good chance to talk to him on Wednesday, and uh, so pray for him. He's trying to convince his family to come here for church. His father thinks his father thinks we're a cult, <laughs> so uh, they cannot have Catholicism. So, and in their eyes, we probably are. So let's pray for uh, Dylan and his family. Um, continue to pray for. Uh, Mark and Louise. Louise called this morning. Mark has a cold, a head cold, and Louise isn't feeling well. And uh, she said that Art didn't get his uh, pneumonia shot this year, so we have to be very careful with him. Continue to pray for Raj and Monty as well, and uh, some others uh, that uh, haven't been with us for physical reasons. And uh, you might have a prayer request. I feel like I'm missing something. Jimmy? No, if, you, if you remember a while back, I, I had asked for prayer for my. My uh, stepkid's father, yeah. that he was sick. He wound up, he passed away last week. Oh, uh, we had the COVID, so uh, he, uh, just for the kids, because even though that I, I raised them, uh, I don't ever want them to forget their father. You know, no matter what, he's still their dad. What was his name? Uh, Bob McGee. You're right. Pray uh, to speak to my daughter regularly. Oh, oh. Okay. That comes from prayer. Nice. I'm trying to get her to come in. Good. I'm sure it'll happen. Good. Tony? My daughter, Laura, has a very cold. Laura? Yeah. What's, what did you say she's? What? A very bad cold. Very cold? Okay. Yeah, very bad cold. All right, Mary? Yes, uh, I guess for prayer for a person named Alana. Yeah, uh, she gave nice. yeah she gave birth a few days ago and it was a very traumatic birth and the baby had lost its heartbeat so the baby is in a different hospital and they said the brain function is not there and the baby's organs are deteriorating so the mother will be able to see the baby they're taking her to say her goodbye so just pray for comfort. Did you see her uterus exploded? Yeah. She had a ruptured uterus during childbirth, and that's when the baby lost its heartbeat. So just pray for them. Christine? Yeah, continued prayer for my mother with sarcoidosis, anemia, scleroderma is getting worse, so she's in a lot of pain. Her pain and my pain, so. <laughs> more, ways, more ways than one. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for praying for no snow so far this winter. It's been working. Yeah. All on the same page there. <laughs> As we <laughs> say, now we're going to get three feet of snow. I can't wait to see that. All right, let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to come together and be in your presence.
presence and we thank our Father that your word uh, gives us information about you so that we know what to do. And we're thankful, Father, that you have uh, provided for us and you're capable of meeting our needs. And even as we're going through difficult times, you're there with us. Help us to share this information with those that need to hear. And we pray for those we uh, have contact with that don't know you, don't believe in you, Father, that we might have opportunities to share the good news with them. We pray, Father, for Elaine, and we pray that she'll be back with us soon, that the infection will go, and that eventually she'll have her knee replaced. We pray for Keith as well, and you be with that couple, and keep them healthy, and we pray for Gerard, and we're thankful, Father, that his relationship with his daughter is uh, better, and we pray for his daughter that one day we might see her here. We uh, pray for Matt Dorak and that he would be with him as he struggles to walk and that the, the doctors would have a plan so that uh, they would uh, give his legs more uh, oxygen than any blood and that he would be able to walk. We pray for um, Dylan now he's back in college that you would put a hedge around him, Father, keep him from temptations and uh, help him find other believers that he can fellowship with with Art and Louise and keep Art from pneumonia and be with them as they try to stay healthy, um, be with Jimmy's uh, family, uh, stepkids as they mourn the loss of their biological father, Lord, and that he would just be with that whole situation, be with Tony's daughter as well, uh, Laura and uh, the rest of his kids, father, and that he would be with them and uh, be with Alana as she uh, says goodbye to her uh, baby, father, and that he would be with that situation. Pray for Justine's mom and she has to deal more with the, the medical problems that she has and the pain that, that she would be able to find some kind of release from that. Be with Justine and uh, the family as they help her. And uh, I pray that in the moments that we have left, Father, that you would be able to give us the concentration and open heart to the Holy Spirit, Father, that as we look into your word, Father, we just give you the praise of Jesus. Just, uh, I don't know what you'd call that, but I sometimes forget things. You might say it right to my face, please pray, and then I forget it. And, but I keep it on the list, so this is in my office as well. So if I didn't mention something that you said, don't take offense to think that I'm an idiot. But you could think that, but um, you know, I pray for everybody on a regular basis. Even some things that I, then I find out the person has been in heaven for a year. <laughs> necessarily always come back with uh, um, information. Uh, one good thing is uh, Miriam made it to Brazil and, and uh, everything's okay. She's staying with family for a while. Uh, she's going to have her apartment painted and uh, the family that lived there had been there for 15 or 20 years so uh, they kept it in good shape. She's in good spirits but she said she cried the whole way. Yeah. Uh, she sat on the tarmac in Miami for two hours while they tried to figure out why the plane wouldn't go. No, they were a rubber band and they were on the way. <laughs> we went to Germany one year and they said, well, the radios don't work. And uh, or somebody had to sign off. That was all lies. The plane didn't work. We had to fly some other airline, but uh, they keep you hanging there for a while. She's on the airline hoping that they fix the rubber band because they're not letting them off. You know? <laughs> I think that's a little immature on my part. I'm sure they use more of the rubber bands, but you know. I was in the Air Force. I know how things work. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's take our hymn books and the hymn uh, sing the immortal, invisible God. How about that's under not, his wings? What? How about under his wings? All right, let's try sixteen. <laughs> Is that a mile? Invisible. All right, we have. I guess I'm not. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, what verse, the number is that? We'll just sing that one. <laughs> well, we'll just have a, a commercial for a second. While we look it up. <laughs> we'll find that. Because the words are there. It's pretty hard to sing that with the wrong words. 443. What? 443. All right. If you're using a book, it's 443. I am the chest of this. Under his face. You may see it, you may see it.
be someone that delighted in God. And that's what reminded me of David, because in the next chapter we're going to look at, David actually says in um, uh, Psalm 37, 4, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And uh, so that, that springboarded to what we're going to look at today. Because what David does is reveals to us, and uh, without any real uh, fabrication as far as poetic form is, that there are two sides to the human equation. And uh, so that's what we're going to look at today. And I hope that I can uh, share with you some information that you might not have heard before, but nothing's new under the sun. Uh, there's a, a trans, uh, there's a translation uh, hiccup in verse 1. And I'm going to share with you, uh, just so you can know that it's no big deal. It's not a hiccup. Uh, but if you look at it, it says, uh, to the musician, chief musician of the Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, Yahweh, the transgressions of the wicked say it, and it has within my heart, Okay, so my heart. Lebo is um, where we get libido from, is the Hebrew general word for the inner man, the thoughts that we have. The my comes from the masculine that's attached to that Hebrew, verb, that Hebrew noun. And, uh, but there are those that want to use his instead of, um, instead of um, my. So because the context talks about David talking about the sinners. So it's his heart. So there's two routes to take. I took both routes. They all come back the same way. So uh, even though you look at, because if you had a, um, a more modern English translation, it might say uh, his heart, referring to the sinner instead of David's heart, where David uh, is giving an oracle from God, basically, and from his position. So I think that uh, uh, my heart is the better reading here. Either way, it comes out the same way in the translation. And so these are the minor things that you'll see as you do word studies. The, sometimes the, the personal pronouns aren't necessarily there in Hebrew, but they're attached to the noun that's speaking about whether it's masculine or feminine or whatever. In this case, uh, the possessive my uh, here for David really kind of reflects David's position because he gives us this um, opportunity to see mankind in, uh, in two ways. First, and some people have labeled it differently than others, and I kind of want to sim symbolize it for <laughs> our own sake. And I just pulled out the rebellious sin. Uh, all men have sin. So any, you could have put it as the unbeliever. This is their place. And uh, uh, because of the translation difficulties, Calvin thought it was, Dave was talking about the worst of sinners, and then Kidner says, well, now it includes every man because all men as fallen have these characteristics in late development, and I agree with him. So where some people would divide this into two groups, David really is bringing out two groups, one believers and one non-believers. Not basically looking at how bad they are, but their deficiency of belief in God. And uh, so David looks at sin as a part of the problem that uh, all men have and that when left go, when left to its own nature, will uh, actually uh, manipulate the sinner into uh, getting to the point where he can look at sin and think that it's okay. So this is the, that's the big theological breakdown of this passage that I gave you for free. In college, seminary, it's $800 a credit hour. If you want to pay me that $800, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. if, if you don't try, you never, you know, get pushed back. You know, I don't know how it works. But let's look at this. The, at verse 1. The rebellious sinner. Here David describes the rebellious condition of those apart from God. This is the first four verses. He says, uh, the transgression... Um, that, that can be looked at as the rebellion of the wicked saved within their heart. There's no fear of God before his eyes. What that fear is in Hebrew is the word for terror, which implies the idea that they're not scared of God because they don't acknowledge him. 
So um, today, you'll find a lot of people, when you ask them, do you believe in God? They'll say yes, but their yes is conditioned on the definition of their God. And so I'm not afraid of, uh, that person won't be afraid of the God that they've manufactured in their own life because that God allows them to live the way they want. So what David is showing us is that, first of all, there is no God in their lives. And if you look at today's society, um, how can otherwise people act without no God? No God, anything is uh, available. Man has become up with their own religion, humanism. They have removed uh, creation for evolution. Now they're removing the distinctive characteristics of humans themselves. There's no male, there's no female. I'm not sure what we are now. We're all it's, I guess. But, uh, that's the direction they're going in because what Satan would like to do is destroy any evidence of God in his world. So uh, the Bible says we are created in his image. And so he's foiling that image and trying to remove it. So man today, without God, has to come up with ideas about themselves so that they feel confident about themselves. And uh, uh, many believe that David is inferring that sin deceives the sinner by flattering him so that he does not fear God or hate sin. Look at the next verse. Verse 2 says, For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity is uh, iniquity be found to be hateful. So pride, uh, he's too proud to recognize and give up his sin. He has, uh, his mind has been uh, uh, changed to look at what he is doing as okay. Uh, that's why uh, man today can do whatever he wants and justify it. How do, how do people justify killing people and maiming people? When I worked at a reform school, we had a kid from central Philly that was sent to us because he shot a kid for his Air Nikes. And uh, in the course of the time he was with us until he was removed and certified and put to jail in the 16th, uh, I asked him, I said, why did you shoot that kid? I, I wanted the Nikes. My mom said I couldn't have any. And that was his justification. That's an example of a human without God, without unrestrained. Now, let me qualify that because I caught myself thinking last night, without God. Now, I can change that to say that they do have a God, but his name is different. Jesus reminded the Pharisees that their father was Satan. And so Satan is in control of this world as far as God allows him. He's called the prince and power of the air. And man involved in his own sin are following his father. Now, Satan is a liar and a thief. And uh, everything about him is negative or sinful. And so man without the living God is in the camp of the non-living or non-real God, which would be Satan himself. So uh, that's one perspective that you can take when you're looking at the, the parallelism that David gives us in this passage. That sinners uh, have a potential of sinning and continuing to sin in every aspect of their life. Matter of fact, he says... Uh, that the words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. So iniquity is uh, another word for sin, sinfulness. And so everything about him has to do with his own nature. His, his words, his communication are iniquity and deceit, and he had left off to be wise to do good, to not to do good. Left off to be wise and, okay, yes. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He had left off. Okay, that's what throws me off. That's the negative part. And he has walked away from truth, and he was he his, he has uh, nothing to do with good. Now, uh, most of the people that we have contact with are quasi bad, right? That's a fancy way to say that they're kind of bad, but not always bad. They're uh, sinful, but they're not walking around with an axe looking to chop somebody up. <clears throat> That's their potential. Most people in our society, uh, most of their transgression is verbal uh, through deceit and lies and uh, manipulation. So we find a lot of that today. Uh, the folks that I try to witness to in my bowling circle and golf circle, they
they fit into that category. Most of them would say that they believe in God, but their definition would be different than the Bible's definition of God. Their God they're not afraid of. Their God hopes. They're hoping that their God will forgive them or look the other way or think, well, he's not as bad as so-and-so God. And uh, that's the way they live. And that's the lie that Satan has planted in the world today. David brings that out by saying that those that don't fear God, uh, their perception is uh, mute or skewed. And uh, uh, <clears throat> Psalm 14, 1 says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And that's the their mantra that they live, that they are able to do whatever they want. This kind of transitions into pride. They're puffed up thinking that, well, if I run the show, then my show can be any show that I want. So there's a natural pride which deceives them into thinking that they're okay. We've all been there. You might be thinking, oh, wait a second. What do you mean by that? We've all fooled ourselves into thinking that some of the things that we said are done in the past have been okay. But according to God's word, it was sin. And uh, uh, once you came to Christ, the potential of that is still available to you. But now, if you surrender to him, you'll do that less. One author brings up that those that are willing to look forward to a day to get away with something, uh, their God has been skewed. Meaning, if you're planning, like I use this example with my wife. She's going away for a week upstate, so that means that I'm free to go to McDonald's and Wendy's and Burger King and Pizza Hut. No, 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 not Pizza Hut. I've, I've grown in my pizza awareness. And, you know, all the stuff that I don't normally do because mom watches my weight. Um, that might not sound bad, but I'm just using an example of, you know, I can get away with this now, I'm going to do this. Um, that means that my understanding of who God is is skewed. Uh, either because of sin I become callous or I'm not a believer at all. Because if you believe in God and you know who he is, you know what he is capable of. He's aware of all things. He knows your thoughts. Matter of fact, he knows what you're going to think 10 years from now at 2 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday the 5th. I guess you get that accurate. He's omniscient. He's all-powerful. Uh, he, he, he records everything about us. So how do we get that information to our feet? If God is aware, God knows, God is with us, that should help us when our old nature says, well, no one will know. It's okay once in a while. We want to sin less in life and not allow ourselves to be coddled into uh, uh, playing around with sin. That's the bottom line. I mean, there's a softer approach to this passage, but David says there's two, two people standing here. One is looking at God as a delight for life. The other is looking at a God that's not really there. Because everything they do, everything they say, uh, the words of his mouth, he divides this mischief upon his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He... he he loves, he, ab he abhorreth not. So let's change that. He, uh, he does not reject evil. He accepts it. So uh, if you find yourself in that category, you got a problem. All of us are not perfect. But if you know Christ your Savior, there's a intent in the heart to please him. To try to sin less. I had a friend that was a Bible Baptist preacher, and they're pretty legalistic. So he helped the church out. And he had a big list on the wall of do's and don'ts. Don't drink coke. Don't wear a purple tie. Women, always wear dresses. You know, and right down the line, this would help you, not to sin. I'm thinking the guy is a nutcase because in, in Christ we're free. To be slave to Christ, to do us to Christ. We don't need a list. All we need is his word. And his Bible, the Bible shows us to uh, avoid all appearances of evil. And it's, it's conclusive and individual. What I feel is wrong, but you don't. It doesn't apply to you. The Bible says if you think it's sin, it is sin to you. 
So it means that everything about our lives, our judgments have to be reflected within ourselves. How many of you like to judge people? Yeah, that guy over there, he, he's a no-gooder. He's got a tattoo and a hook and a string and a wire. And, uh, you know, he's wearing foreign shoes. And, you know, he, he doesn't eat the same kind of drinks that are common. You know, there's all sorts of things that people make up. It all falls into to nowadays racism, but it, it's just the way God made us. But for believers that have been free, we can't do that anymore. Because we're all equal in Christ. And we're all the same. Jesus, if you're a child of God, we're brothers and sisters. There's no difference. You know, say, well, we don't look alike. But that's not what God's word says. He says we're alike. We're both our white washed in the blood of Christ. We're all the same, sinless in his sight. So as believers in the first century, they were known because they loved each other. Genuinely loved each other, cared for each other. No judging, no nothing. And uh, unfortunately, as the world turns wrong, things creep in. And one of the things we have to try to stay away from is that same thing. So we have to recognize and uh, change, and even in our own our thoughts about everything. The world, our country, our our government. We don't like it, but we have to step back and say, okay. I might personally like this, but what does God's word say? God is the one that sets up and takes out. He may moves people this way, changes things for his, his goal, his purpose. So I might not like what happens, but I have to accept what God wants for us and learn from it and still be faithful to him. I said this in my Sunday school class today. Uh, when Christ was in his three and a half year ministry, he wasn't campaigning to get rid of Rome. That's what they were hoping for. He wasn't trying to change society. He was trying to change people's lives because salvation is the ultimate gift that God has given to mankind. And uh, our job is to tell people about that. And uh, uh, Jesus says, you know, they hate me, they're going to hate you. They're not interested. They don't want to hear it. They can't see it. They're spiritually blind. But the Word of God is living. And as we plant the Word of God in their hearts, it's the Holy Spirit that opens their eyes. So we, uh, our job is to share the gospel with people, regardless if they hear it, regardless of what camp they come from. It doesn't matter. Whoever bring, God brings into your place, look for ways to share the gospel with them. That's the one thing that I think that David brings out in the second part here. Because what we're looking at is the, the unbeliever. His proclamation this iniquity and deceit. His pursuit is always uh, to the left, always to the evil side. He uh, loves evil, hates good. His passion, he devises mischief upon his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good um, and not to do good. He devises all these things. And then David stops. Usually David in his poetic form will have it kind of like an interlude and then begin the second part. He just stops. So there's man right now. So any unsaved person you have, no matter how good they seem to be or not, they're in the same boat. The potential for sin is there, and that's pretty much where they're going with everything they say, do, and think. Number two, David begins uh, a, a great section for us, uh, the redeemed saints. And he starts out by saying, Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reaches unto the clouds. Now that uh, word mercy is uh, translated many times different ways. Um, and a matter of fact, even in this passage, it, it was translated, uh, let's see, um, first time it comes up. Oh, right. well, maybe that's where I start right there because it, it uh, can be translated love and kindness. Some people label it royal love, and depending on uh, who you read, uh, the, the, ver the, the, the idea there is uh, uh, God's mercy is overwhelming to people. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. <clears throat> Thy judgments are great and deep, O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness. Now that's the same word that we used for mercy just a few minutes ago. 
So the interchanging of the word is there. And I really like the idea of royal love. But um, sometimes in the New Testament we use the word agape love, the unconditional love. There's several words for uh, New Testament love. But what we have in this section is uh, uh, actually nothing but God, the redeemed saint. David revealed the great contrast between the rebellious sinner and the redeemed saint. Uh, we have much to rejoice about. He, re he mentions the saint's security, uh, verses 5 through 7. Everything that we know as a believer today is connected with God himself, our salvation, our position here in life, um, our health, our uh, economic situation, all these things God has in his hand. And so one of the things that we can learn from is the concept of contentment. Contentment doesn't necessarily mean that you'll never want anything, but anything that you do want, you want it to reflect God's will for your life. So this uh, gaining things, there's a phrase that uh, man uses in our society, the guy that dies with the most toys wins. Uh, that's not real true, unless the toys are being stored in heaven. You know, because the Bible says we're to store all our treasure there. Uh, the focus isn't necessarily on treasure. I mean, I don't have an address for you to send you money. You can send it to me, and I'll take care of it for you. But uh, <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. But those things that you look at as the most valuable in life, that's what you're talking about. Those are the things you store in heaven. Uh, salvation, our, our relationship, and all those things that are very important for us as believers. Everything physical is going to be gone. Uh, everything that you have that's made out of um, uh, material is going to go one day. Matt always tells me there's no pockets in your last suit. And uh, it's, a, it's interesting to think about because a lot of people think that they're going to take it with them or somehow they're going to. This is what God is telling us. We are here about a vapor and then we're gone. So what time we have, uh, we cannot afford to spin our wheels. We want to mature in our relationship. That means that we have to spend quality time digging in his work. So it always comes back to this. My last church, they complained about me. Uh, preaching the gospel too much. Remember that? <clears throat> she doesn't remember anything. <clears throat> she wasn't privileged to some of the things I had to take in starts. Why do you keep telling us the gospel? Why do you keep preaching about Jesus dying on the cross? We're all saved here. And that's where I thought, mm, maybe not. Because <laughs> this is a wonderful story that we weave into every Bible story that everything that we have in Christ is because of him and what he accomplished on the cross. I didn't get away from that. Even David, as he's looking forward to one day being in God's presence, recognizes that everything is from God and that uh, God, all of uh, uh, man or the believer's security is found in God, his compassion, his, um, his character. Uh, verse 6 says, Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are deep. David knew the redeemed found security within the divine character of the Lord himself. God's commitment, verses 6 and 7, the Lord, thou preparest man and beast, uh, preserve us. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. We sang that song, didn't we? So we think about the uh, understanding of God's security means that we just surrender who we are and fall back into his hands. And let God have his way with us. God's uh, commitment reflects in the saints' satisfaction. Look at verse 8 and 9. They shall be abundantly satisfied. What's the last time that, that was a characteristic that you revealed? You were totally satisfied with life. That can happen. With the fatness of thy house. We're all on diets here. But the New Testament, throw that out, Old Testament. The fatness means the richness of God's house. And uh, thou shalt uh, allow us or make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. And uh, um, uh, the pleasures can uh, mean delicacies. So God gives us the best that he has for us at the time. So, hey, you have bread, butter, and cheese for supper? Praise the Lord for that. That's better than having anything that was ill-gotten. You know, honest food, God has provided for us. And uh, what God has provided for you here in this humble little church 
You know, there's some churches out there that cost millions and millions of dollars. They have uh, everything that you can imagine. Push a button, a cup of coffee pops up in your pew. Imagine that. I'd like to have that right here, Keith. <laughs> a cup holder right there. But what we find from the New Testament is this building is supposed to be for training and preparing us to go outside with that message. The New Testament says, uh, how beautiful are the feet of those who carry the good news, the gospel message. I think I've got that one part. It's pretty much the same thing. But uh, I was always fascinated when I read that in Sunday school about the feet and uh, how beautiful are the feet. Feet are probably not the most beautiful part of the human body. Look at your big, ugly feet, your big toes and stuff. But it's not the feet, it's the, the transportation of the gospel. And uh, that's one thing that God has for us all to be a part of, you know, is to carry that good news and share it with them. The great thing about the uh, gospel message is we don't have to embellish it. We don't have to make up stuff. To make, you know how they, uh, I want to sell you this property. It's got a waterfall on it. It's beautiful, Matt was telling me. And they went up in the Catskills and climbed this mountain. And uh, Matt's like, where's the water? There was a lead pipe or something coming out of a hole in the ground. That was the waterfall. But while they were going, they were imagining this beautiful picture of the waterfall. We don't have to do that with the gospel. The gospel in itself is beautiful. It tells us that the sin that's sending us eternally to the lake of fire and hell is removed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which in turn is a free gift to anyone that would believe. What a wonderful statement. What a wonderful thing God has done. Man's religion says, you do this, this, and this, and this, and we'll hope for the best. Matter of fact, you might have to go somewhere for a while until we figure it out. But God's word says, instantaneous, the blood of Christ, past, present, future sins. What a wonderful lesson. How can you embellish that? You know, people try to dumb it down. Don't use the word sin because they get offended. Use morally challenged. And let's change this. No, we want to give it in its, uh, its purest form because that's where the Holy Spirit works in their hearts. In our society today, they laugh at it. I use this phrase now, the bullet. Like, it goes over really well. When someone curses, I go up and say, you know what you need? Jesus. Walk away. <laughs> they don't know what to say. <laughs> it's funny to watch. And I think I've been doing it kind of fleshly. But, I mean, what else can you say? I use this, the Lord's name, man, I want to knock him out. That's like talking about my mom. You know, we, God is the one that has provided everything for this guy who is lost in a sense. He needs Jesus. Why not? I mean, I say that all the time now. So far, I haven't even gotten hit. But, I mean, what a wonderful testimony. Because maybe he might go home and think, well, maybe I do need something. You know? Why am I saying this? You don't ever hear anybody use Satan's name in vain. Why is that? You know? And uh, when I was younger, I used that as a credibility that God was real. If it wasn't, why would people use his name in vain like that? You know? Because it would just be funny to just use up anything else. It's one of those things that you look for as believers, as an authenticator for you, as as, uh, as being one of his. And David brings out the black and white of it. For us, as believers, we should be delighted in God's provision, God's salvation. Matter of fact, David's thoughts don't aren't exhaustive in the differences between the rebellious and the redeemed. But it does provide enough to reveal great need for Christ. In our just in our social living here, there's a big gap between a believer and a non-believer. Attitudes, direction, uh, just outlook. I find a lot of them have no hope for the future. They have not. They don't. All they know is now. And uh, uh, one person. A wise person and said, instead of wondering why God allows that person to get the strike and you get the split, think about it this way. That's his only reward, is whatever he does here. His next life is going to be eternal punishment. You can suffer for a little bit here for what you have in the future. I think he was going a little too far about that, the bowling analogy. But I understand that as believers, we cannot afford to shun 
those that we uh, come in contact with because they're uh, of a different race, a different religion, uh, a different behavior. Uh, the worst sinner that uh, the Bible records was the guy's name was Saul. And he, in the beginning, was putting Christians to death. And uh, everybody was afraid of him. He had official papers to go elsewhere and go after Christians and split their families up until he met Jesus. And everything changed. It's all about him. Even in your own life, if you're struggling with sin, it all begins with the Lord Jesus Christ. What does this Bible tell us? What can we do? How can we uh, walk away from that? It's all found within the Word of God. David reveals to us that God is able. He has everything that we need. And uh, there, verse 12, he says, I can see them. I, the workers of iniquity are fallen. They have been knocked down. They have been cast down and shall not be able to rise. There, there's no hope for them. So our hope is in Christ. And that's the message that we have to bring to the non-believers. Remember, look at them this way. They don't believe in God. So everything we should talk to them about should take them that route. Not about how great the Baptist Church is. We got, uh, you know, we don't really have anything going for us here. No. We, have, we do have two air conditioners that still work. That's all, of course, right? We have a leaky baptistry. Uh, we do have a functioning coffee cup thing. You know, we don't have the amenities, we don't have coffee and bagels and all that stuff, but we have Jesus. And that's all that we need. Matter of fact, anything above that is not, 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 not essential for us to share that good news. So this is your job this week. Tell someone about Christ. Or show them in your own behavior. That's the best testimony to start with. Build a bridge in their lives by living a life that reflects Christ. They'll ask you, they'll ask you why. You don't have to tell them. And, and then share with them what Christ has done for you. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for this time. We're thankful, Lord, that you have wonderfully loved us and, and provided redemption for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for each one of us that we might be encouraged to uh, just get into the Bible and uh, study it and apply it in our lives. Help us to say no to sin when, it's, when we're faced with it. And help us to be uh, warriors, Father, and prayer warriors that we might pray for those that are under the weather, those that have physical needs, Father, and we just give you the praise. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Let's sing one more hymn together. Um, let's stand together and sing, come down.
Pray for uh, uh, those that are really ill today. Be with Art and Louise, Father, that you would keep them from poor sickness and be with Elaine and, and for Matt and uh, pray for Rajivani as well. Help us, Father, to put you first and we just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.